Brother Robert R. Taylor, Jr. Thank you so kindly, B.J. I almost thought to myself, I can't wait to hear that man speak. <laughs> what a great week this always has been, the week that we have a lectureship here at Memphis. Doing a little bit of thinking in the past, I remember back in the 1960s, around 1966, 67, and 68, and reading the plans of the Knight Arnold elders and Brother Roy J. Hearn about the establishment of this school. And it just thrilled my soul to its very depths. And then I had the opportunity of beginning to speak in uh, 1970, and it's always been one of the highlights of my year. Thank you for letting me come again. A little bit on the lighter side, I heard about a man who was presenting a lecture and his audience was composed primarily of men. And in the course of his message, he said, there are no perfect men. And he said, if there's a perfect man in this audience, would you please stand? And one man stood. And the speaker said, are you telling us that you are a perfect man? He said, no, sir. Well, are you telling us that you know somebody that is perfect? He says, I do. Would you tell us who that person is? He said, my wife's first husband. <laughs> wife's first husband. And thinking about the title of our lesson tonight, we have three very important words, and one is judgment, and one is God, and one is truth. Think about all that the Bible has to say about these three important words. We are really educated in the teaching of the Bible when we begin to read it from beginning to end and read about all the judgments, read about all the truths, read about all the honor and the praise and the glory that is ascribed to Jesus Christ and to his heavenly Father, Jehovah God. Isn't it wonderful that we can have the timeless trinity upon which to think, upon which to meditate, and through prayer, through Jesus and his name, we can approach the majesty of the sovereign of the universe, Almighty God himself. How wonderful it is that we can do that very thing. There are a number of judgments that are set forth in the Bible. We read about the judgment that came to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. We read about the judgment that came upon Cain, their firstborn, in Genesis 4. We read about the judgment that came upon the generation of Noah. And with the exception of Noah and the seven members of his family, the entire world of that day had turned to the devil and had begun to major in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. We begin to notice how evil people can be when we study about Sodom and Gomorrah a little bit later on in the book of Genesis. And you remember the judgment that came upon these cities. They were warned and uh, they paid no attention to it. Only seven people plus Noah survived uh, among all the population of the world of that day. We have judgments that were, give, that were uh, leveled against uh, the two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Of course, there had been the United Kingdom under Saul, David, and Solomon for 120 years. And then with the division of the kingdom, we have the northern and the southern. And there was a great deal of rivalry between the north and between the south. And the northern kingdom had 19 kings, and I do not recall reading a single one that would really be counted as a righteous monarch. And even in the kings that ruled over Judah, 
I cannot recall very many of them that would have been righteous and sober and godly in their management of God's people. That shows the, the power that sin and Satan have within the human family. We read about the judgments that came upon uh, the northern kingdom by the Assyrian nation, about the judgment that came upon the nation of Judah as uh, the Babylonian people came against them. And then on into the New Testament, perhaps the greatest degree of suffering that anybody has ever suffered was with the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. And Jesus spoke about that coming destruction in three different chapters. In Matthew, the 24th chapter, in Mark, the 13th chapter, and in Luke, the 21st chapter. And Jesus declared that whenever that destruction descends, it will be something unlike anything else that has ever happened or ever will happen. That's what sin can do to the human family. And then we have the judgment that we're going to talk about tonight, the final judgment. And uh, that is something that is very serious indeed. I'm told that Daniel Webster, the great statesman from the New England area, a very devout man and a very fluent and eloquent speaker, that he was one time asked, what is the most serious thought that you have ever entertained? He did not go to any of the battles that he had fought upon the floors of Congress for the preservation of the beloved republic of which he was a part, an appreciated part. He did not go to anything that had happened to him personally, but he said the most serious thing that I've ever entertained is the concept of standing before God in judgment, giving an account of the way that I have lived and conducted myself. And really, when we turn our own attention to that, is there a more serious thought that we could entertain than this tonight? And thinking about the judgment, I want to raise some questions and give biblical answers to them. First of all, is there going to be a standard for this judgment? Well, negatively speaking, it will not be the, the laws of mankind. It will not be the philosophers that have been uh, writing through the years. It will not be the doctrines and commandments of men. It will not be any of these. It will not be the Baptist manual for Baptist people. It will not be the Methodist confessional for people of that persuasion. It will not be for the atheists uh, and others who have subscribed to the concept, there is no God. There's a standard, and that standard is going to be the Bible. We're told both in the Old Testament that God will judge mankind in righteousness and according to the truth. That's taught clearly in the book of Psalms. And we're told furthermore in the Old Testament that God will cause everyone who has ever lived to come before him and people will be judged according to the deeds done in the Bible. And the Bible teaches, that, teaches the same in the New Testament. Every single one of us without exception is going to make an appearance at the judgment. I remember listening to the late Billy Graham in one of his crusades out in a western state, I believe it may have been Denver. This was way back in the 1950s. And he really startled me with a message that he gave. It was on radio, it was on television, and it was before several people gathered together in the stadium where he was conducting one of his crusades. He said, now when you people get to the judgment, do not look for Billy Graham for I am not going to be there. He really perked up my ears when I heard that. I thought, are you going to try to justify that from the scriptures? Well, I think he misinterpreted Romans 8 and 1, but that was the appeal that he made. 
But Romans 8 and 1 does not make an exception of Billy Graham not being in the judgment. It does not make an exception for you and me not being in the judgment. We are going to be there. In fact, the Bible teaches in Romans, the Bible teaches in 2 Corinthians, that we all are going to stand before the judgment bar of God to give an account of the way that we have lived, the way that we have thought, the way that has the way that ways that have motivated us, and whether we have lived to the honor of God or in the service of Satan and sin. This is really a serious matter that we're facing tonight. And then the Bible teaches that we're not going to be judged by human philosophy. Many people prize human philosophy far more than anything that came from Moses, far more than anything that came from Isaiah, far more than anything that came from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, James, and John. These are inspired writings. These have come from the very mind of Almighty God, from His infinite uh, uh, thinking and thoughts and everything that He has desired for the human family to experience. But many people are not interested in what God has to say. But we're going to be judged by a standard, and that standard is going to be the Bible. That's why we need to study the Bible almost every day. Well, every day, I don't want to say almost. We need to be daily students of the Bible. We need to study the Bible studiously. We need to study the Bible prayerfully. We need to study the Bible relentlessly. We need to study the Bible regardless of whatever we might have to omit during a day in order to treasure the Word of our God. Remember, the Bible is the Word of life. It is the bread of life. It is the light of the world. It is the salt and the savior of the world. And so the Bible must come first and foremost. And so this is going to be the standard of judgment. And not only that, but the Bible actually labels some people who are going to be present at the judgment. We know that Sodom and Gomorrah are going to be present at judgment. We know that Tyre and Sodom are going to be present at judgment. We know that Jesus said that it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sodom in the day of judgment than for Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum, three cities in which he had done some of his most elo eloquent and excellent preaching. And yet, for the most part, they had turned deaf ears to the, very, to the very prince of life, to the very one who had come to give his life as a ransom for humanity. What a wonderful Savior we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then another question about judgment. Uh, well, before I get to, uh, away from that point, I remember uh, a number of things that people have taught about the judgment. When I was just a boy growing up in northwest Tennessee, I remember hearing some of the brethren talk about a certain movement that had its beginning over in the neighboring state of, of Arkansas. Some had decided that judgment is in this life and not the next world after all. We are going to be judged at the last day. Jesus said that whoever rejects me and rejects my word has one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. We do not have to be in any doubt whatsoever before we recognize and readily accept that the word of Jesus is going to uh, be the standard of authority. Also, they're going to be, there's going to be a great division on that day. All are going to be there, even Billy Graham. And it's going to be consisting of two great divisions of people. One will be greatly from the standpoint of evil the standpoint of sinful, 
the standpoint of irreverence, the standpoint of immorality. And that will get, I think, most of the people that have lived in the centuries from Adam down to the present. And these people will be placed on the left hand on the day of judgment. That's what Jesus teaches in Matthew, the 24th chapter. And then the righteous people, the second class of people, will be placed on his right hand. To the former, he will say, Depart from me, ye wicked, or ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. To which they will reply, Lord, when did we fail to give you food or drink or, or take care of you? Jesus had just said, when I was sick, you didn't come to see me. When I was uh, uh, in pain, you did not comfort me. When I was hungry, you did not feed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me no water to slake my thirst. And of course, they would want to know, when did we treat thee in such fashion? He said, inasmuch as you have not, had, not have done this to the least of my brethren, you have not done it unto me. And then to that great and bright people group on the right hand, he will say, come. There is really as much difference between heaven and hell as there is between that depart and that come. One means people are going to be there eternally in punishment. The other means that the saved will be there in comfort, in pleasure, pleasure that has as pleasure that will be greater than anything that we've ever known here upon the earth. These are wonderful glories that we have of the wonderful land known as heaven. And so when we think about these matters, it ought to motivate every one of us to do everything that we possibly can in the way of gospel obedience in order that we might be placed not on the left hand, but on the right hand, that we might be among that fortunate group who will hear that golden word, that all comprehensive word, come, come, you blessed of my Father. That's how much Jesus loves people. That's how much he loves us. That's how much he loves his, his disciples, his learners, his students here upon the earth. Not only that, but what's going to happen to people who are not ready to meet the Lord? They are going to be sent to eternal hell. And the Bible talks about the two destinies. We have people today who say there is no such thing as heaven. There is no such place as hell. That this life is all there is to it. That when we die, we're just like a dog dead all over and there's nothing that survives. But the Bible teaches that man is composed of more than flesh and blood and bone and muscle. Man, the inclusive of women, man is made in the likeness of God. God has placed a soul within that body of yours, within the body of mine, and even though this body of ours is destined to go back to the dust, provided the Lord does not come in our lifetime. But the soul will never be destroyed. It will live forever in one of two places, the glories of heaven or the glory of hell. And so we're talking about serious matters indeed. And then again, in thinking about the judgment we want to think about what's going to happen to us if we fail to live the Christian life, if we do not feed the hungry, if we do not clothe the naked, if we do not give water to the ones who are greatly in thirst. That's going to be a tragedy to know that the Lord is not going to take us to heaven. He's going to send us to our own deserved punishment eternal hell itself. And then how fortunate we'll be for those on that right hand. In fact, the Bible talks about, uh, uh, and really one of the great songs that we sing, 
There's a Great Day Coming, Will, uh, written by Will Thompson. Speaking about Thompson, another beautiful story connected with him. Dwight Moody was one of the outstanding preachers in the denominational world of his day. And he one time said to Will Thompson, he said, Will, I would give all that I have accomplished if I had been the one that wrote softly and tenderly as you have. That's how much he loved that song. And I love that song, and I know you do too. I guess out of all my favorite invitation hymns, that would be way up at the top. And so there's going to be a day that we'll be glad. There's going to be a day that we'll be sad. There's going to be a day of gladness. There's going to be a day filled with gloom. And what we do in this life is going to determine our ultimate destiny. Now, in order to live the Christian life, it is essential that we obey the gospel. This is what we mean by obeying the first principles and or the first law of pardon. And the Bible is clear, even though the denominational world has messed up the gospel plan of salvation in so, mu in so much of a multitude of ways. But the Bible teaches the necessity of hearing. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It is essential that we have faith, faith in God, faith in Christ, faith in the Holy Spirit, faith in the holiness of God's uh, sterling and wonderful word. And the Bible teaches in Hebrews 11 and verse 6 that uh, uh, it is impossible to please God unless we have faith. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And then there must be a departure from sin. We know this is a repentance. This is a change. It is a change of mind. It is prompted by godless sorrow, and it results in a changed attitude, a changed motive in life, and a change in thinking, a change in motive, and a change in speech, and a change in daily deeds. That's the power that we have in helping to determine what our ultimate destiny, destiny is going to be. And then there must be a confession. Think how fortunate it is and what a happy occasion it is to be able to say from the lips and then from the heart, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Alan Hires has told the story a number of years about being in New York City as a young man. He and another young man had gone with an older preacher to New York City, and they had obtained permission to have a service in New York's famed Central Park. And a little while before the service was scheduled to occur, Alan and the other young man went in and among the people that were walking in the park, there were numerous ones doing that, and they said to each one, we're going to have a religious service in a certain part of the park, and we'd like to invite you to come. Alan said he met a rather, uh, a rather dignified uh, gentleman. He appeared to be very elaborate in his thinking, I mean in his dress and in his speech, and uh, Alan went up to him and introduced him and told him why he was in the city of New York at that time. And he told him about the religious service. He had a tract that he handed to this man. And in the tract was the name Jesus Christ. When the man saw it, he handed it back. He really shoved it back to Alan and said, I do not believe that he ever lived. That's one of the most stupid things that any person can say. Even time itself is dated B.C. and A.D. He is the greatest one in regard to time and how time is actually figured out 
and determine from time to time. In the BC area, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and the Isaiah, the major prophets and the minor prophets, all lived in the BC area. And uh, the great prophets of the Old Testament prophesied about the coming of the Son of God. And then the A.D., this is in the year of our Lord. And uh, we, of course, have lived in the second great era of time. And so uh, whenever we talk about 2022, we're talking roughly about 2022 years when something happened in our universe around time itself is actually regulated. And that, of course, would be the birth of Jesus Christ. Back to this man who said, I do not believe that he ever lived. I think if I were that man with that disposition, it would bother me every day that I wrote a check to pay a bill if I had to write down, well, this year, 2022 A.D. And uh, it seems to me that would really uh, get to the... Uh, get, get under the skin of the atheistic community. And so whenever we think about uh, the heavenly world, we're thinking about a place of glory. We're thinking about a place of happiness. We're thinking about a place of no pain. We're thinking about a place of no sorrow. We're thinking about a place of no sickness. We're thinking about a place where there will not be any robbery. We're thinking about a place where there will not be any cursing. Nobody in heaven will ever take the name of the Lord in vain. I don't think it's going to be that way in hell. And uh, they, they are going to reap the punishment of having taken the name of the Lord and trounced his book and decided against Jesus Christ and the salvation that he graciously tenders to mankind. And then when we, when we think of this wonderful realm of heaven, there are, one of the most beautiful things, about, beautiful things about heaven to me is the association, association with God the Father. He's the one to whom we have addressed our prayer. We're thinking about association with Jesus. He's the one that has made possible the scheme of human redemption. We're thinking about being with the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead three. And of course, according to the teaching of the Bible, the Holy Spirit has inspired the scriptures. And we are thinking about the association with the finest people, the cream of the crop, humanly speaking, the faithful under the Old Testament, under patriarchal times, the faithful under Mosaic times, and the faithful under the Christian dispensation. And all of it can be traced to the grace of God and the love of Jesus Christ and the inspiration of the Holy Bible by the Holy Spirit of God. We live in a fine era. We, feel, we live in a fine era of time. We have all the Bible. People who lived before Christ did not have all the Bible. People who lived while Christ was here had not received the entirety of the Bible. But when John laid his head upon his pillow and breathed his last breath, the Bible stood completed. He had done his five books. Paul had done his 13 or 14 books. Peter had done his two. James and John had, or James and Jude had done their one. Matthew had done his. Mark had done his. Luke had done his two. And then, of course, John having done his five. John, the gospel, first, second, and third John, and then the book of Revelation. Don't you want to go to heaven? Well, the, earth, the way to do it is to obey the gospel. And then after we've confessed with our lips and from the heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, we are privileged to be baptized, to be buried in the waters of baptism. And the Bible says that we are baptized into Christ. 
that we are baptized into the church. And that word into is a word of transition. Before baptism, a person is outside the church, outside the saving body of Christ. After baptism, a person is on the inside. Hence, in baptism and uh, the commandments that come before it, we make the transition from the outside where there's damnation to the inside where there is the sweetness of salvation. And then after baptism, we have the challenge to, leave, leave, uh, to live the Christian life. That means faithfulness in worship. That means faithfulness in our homes. That means faithfulness on the job. That means faithfulness in all of our communications with other people. It means honesty. It means justly. It means a, a sweet disposition of a person that loves God and loves the souls of mankind. We have the wonderful privilege of worshiping God in spirit and in truth. We have the wonderful and challenging opportunity of teaching others about the plan of life. I remember studying with a young man a number of years ago, and upon finishing our study together, I baptized him a little bit later on. He said, I want to thank you for teaching me the Bible. He was grateful, and I was grateful to hear his words uh, that meant so much to me. And I know you can look back to people who have influenced you and be thankful for the wonderful teaching that they've done and the wonderful example that they have set before you in the family and in the church and in all realms of life. If you're not a Christian tonight, we hope that you'll respond by hearing, by believing, by repenting, by confessing, by being baptized, and then, like the eunuch in Acts the 8th chapter, be able to go on your way rejoicing. If subject, why not respond while we stand and sing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.